the American Theatre Wing, and the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts bring you the American Theatre Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theatre. This session, the director. And with me is an American living legend of a director, Harold Prince. Hal, Hi. nice to have you here. Now, I thought, Fire we'd, away. I, I thought <laughs> we'd start at the University of Pennsylvania, because I gather, although unless you want to start earlier than that, I gather that when you went to Penn, um, you, you focused on writing and directing, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah, I wrote, I wrote uh, an original play and directed it and would have given my right arm to win the playwriting award, but won the directing award instead. Ah, so I should have known then and there, but it took me a few more years to realize where I should be working. But so, so you continued writing at that point? I wanted to write, yeah. Well, as a, very, a, a, as a little kid, I wrote, I wrote a lot. I was very solitary. So a nice solitary pursuit is writing uh, plays and your autobiography. I wrote a hell of an autobiography by the time I was 12 or 13. <laughs> and it was called In This Corner. You get it, don't yes, you? Yes, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. But, but did you, was directing something that w was the expedient way to get your, sh your play on? No, I, I wanted to be in the theater. I wanted to be in the theater, w uh, which I suppose is the, the first thing requisite when you when you uh, set out to make a career in a very dangerous field or a very competitive field anyway is you better want to be there very badly because uh, it, sometimes it's harder than when I did it it really wasn't all that difficult yeah. it took a lot of drive and but I, I had luck did pretty you, early on did you want to be an actor never wanted to be an actor never will want to be an actor I'm much too shy and uncomfortable. So the, to the extent that, uh, uh, that I do line readings if they're required or indicate, it's indicating acting and then the actors with whom you're working know that you'd, you would kill them if they did what you just did for them, okay. but they get the essence of what you're getting at. It's a dynamic more than anything else. Now, it, it, interesting, I want to you know, go back to that. In a way, you, you just describe something which is part of what a director does. Do you think that, that, that there are things to be learned to be a director, or do you think it's instinct? Uh, instinct plays a part in everything. There's a great deal to be learned to be a director or to be an artist, as far as I'm concerned. That's a well-overused word. I almost hate using it. But, but I, I think the more you learn, the better chance you have of really creating something. So, I'm a big believer in education, uh, liberal arts education, uh, travel, uh, just collecting information. I love collecting information. I'm particularly interested in history. So I read uh, hist history books, uh, historical books, m probably more than anything else. General reading rather than fiction. And uh, that's uh, uh, fed me over a long career. Uh, so I think you need, to, you, you need to really relish acquiring information and experience. Uh, I also think if you want to be in the theater, and, and this means a lot to me actually, I think you ought to want to acquire a lot of information about the field you want to spend your life in. And I think that if you can lay blame on this younger generation now. Uh, part of the epidemic uh, is, is uh, get rich quick, be successful, be famous quick, quick, and you don't bother to acquire all the building blocks that come with being infatuated with who wrote those plays, uh, who directed them, what is the history of this art form. Uh, you ought to be a groupie. I was a groupie. Well, and so was I, but I think that's, I think what you just said is very, very important. I, I, I think it's interesting to point out that I believe you are unique in many ways, if we can say that, but one of the ways is that the city of Philadelphia has not one but two theaters named in your <laughs> honor, I believe. It's crazy. But, but I think part of your interest in Penn in the old days was that it was a, a, a tryout town, so you it could... Was, it, I saw, uh, I saw everything. But I saw all, all the great legendary American plays. I saw the early Arthur Miller plays and then 
salesman. I saw uh, the uh, Tennessee Williams. I saw Streetcar. I saw, uh, and then a lot of plays in between, uh, uh, all on on the stage of the Locust Street Theater, and uh, which is is gone. It's a very good restaurant, but it's not a theater. And 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 so uh, I saw everything, and. Uh, uh, I became a groupie about really good acting and great directing and so on. So by the time I came back from college to New York, which is where I was born, uh, I, was, uh, I was in awe of a huge number of personalities working in the, artists working in the theater. Well, I think I think that's 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 vital, and I'm sorry that there isn't a, the out of town thing available to people today. But certainly, see everything that, that that's it, around. You have to see everything. But yeah. so when you when you started your career, did did you want to be a director? Uh, when I started my career, uh, when I got out of college, I knew that directing was the answer. I I also hoped that I could still use my my whatever writing abilities I had. I have used them. Yeah, I know. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you, uh, so it's very good to have to be a frustrated playwright if you're going to direct people because uh, w words come more easily to you. You can help them improvise their way out of a problem in a scene. That's happened very significantly on a bunch of shows I've done. And then uh, every once in a while when no one's looking you can put in a line or two <laughs> because you need it so badly. Uh, wonderful playwrights uh, don't mind. They're so <laughs> secure. You know, you, you remind people that uh, uh, in Showboat there are a bunch of scenes, a, whole, a bunch of songs in one scene in the second act, none of which were written uh, by Jerome Kern. Right. It takes a very secure and generous hearted man to let that happen, just as it took a very secure and generous-hearted man in uh, Oscar Hammerstein to, uh, to put another man's name on the lyrics for Bill when actually half of them are his anyway. No, so, but that kind of self-confidence is also lacking today, or maybe there's just a mean-spiritedness that didn't exist when the theater was so much larger and, and, and more... Broader. And broader yeah. and, and, and flourishing. Yeah. How would you define a director's job? Well, <laughs> your very broad definition is, uh, first of all, you really are where the buck stops. Don't let some, anybody Don't tell let you. Don't let a producer, tell producer. You. Don't let a producer tell you that. But, of course, you have to be... I think the primary thing is you have to be a, a good collaborator. And I think you, you have to enjoy collaborating with very disparate groups of people. Uh, if you're doing a musical, you've got the producer, but you've got the book writer, the lyricist, the composer, the set designer, the costume designer, the choreographer, and then a bunch of actors. And I've left out some people. Right. That's a lot of, of uh, collaboration. But it can be stimulating if you love that sort of thing. And if you're, but you're the boss. <clears throat> but you must be the boss. There's got to be somebody who sits there and, and adjudicates, all right, here are all these positions, which one will we take, and, and stays by it. Uh, I think that you need to, I, I think there's a certain amount of, of diplomacy that goes with, uh, with directing, and I think there should be a considerable amount of articulateness. And oddly enough, I can tell you that some of our best uh, choreographer directors were uh, pitifully inarticulate. In dance, they spoke, but uh, in language... They spoke in dance. They had a devil of a time articulating what they wanted. Some of them were hugely successful because they could indicate what they wanted. There is, in, in musical theater, a lot of show me what you have in mind and I'll pick. I'm not one of those directors. I, uh, uh, I certainly respect actors and will let them feed me. But I like to know what's on my mind and find out it, it isn't as good as what they had in mind. But I'm not a big one for, okay, kids, here's the, l let me see what you would do here. Right. Uh, it, it, but was that, was that kind of the way of some of the directing when you started? I, I mean, I've heard that about Josh Logan. He was, think, a, he was a great sort of give me what you I have. I think there's a lot of such direction right now. A lot of such direction. I think there are a lot of people who, uh, if you'll, 
talk with, I have a lot of friends who are actors and they'll say, it's, it's just, we're, it's too free. It's, I don't feel protected. I, I think you should feel like the man who's guiding you has some place he wants to guide you and then you, you don't tell, you, you, when you first start directing, uh, if you're as insecure as I was and as most people are when they're starting, uh, and you start small, I started with a play in, in uh, the summer uh, uh, when I came out of college. You take that play and you, you do little diagrams of where everybody's going to go right. on the set. And then you sit down with the actors and the actor says, supposing I go there and you go, oh my God, but you were supposed to go there. And if the actor goes there, where do all the other people go? You know what I mean? And suddenly you are in in chaos. So, of course, I don't block anything and haven't for years. But I know what the set is right. and I know how the scenery is going to work and I know more specifically what the motor of a specific project is. Each play and or musical has an engine driving it which is very different from another but the, the, the blocking part of what you, you just said, if an actor comes and says, where do I go, you're capa you, you know, one of your responsibilities is to say, wait yeah, a minute, I'll sure, figure that absolutely. out. Absolutely. You can be creative that way, absolutely. But what you can't do is write those uh, uh, traffic, uh, whatever that word is I'm looking for, you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't put that on paper or write it in stone before you have living actors right. to, re to react to it. People do, and when you start your career, you try your damnedest to get them to, to, to get yourself in a place the night before where you won't be humiliated the next <laughs> in morning in rehearsal. I want to take a brief, slightly dangerous diversion, but it'll, it'll be brief. Um, you were a very successful producer before you, or, or before you were a director. Yes, no, that's not absolutely. exactly correct. But well, really. so as a producer, you watched mm -hmm. directors. I watched two of the best. Okay. I, uh, uh, I should say I did direct, I directed uh, uh, th three plays in summer stock the year I came out of college in, in New Jersey, and I directed for the New York State Arts Council for the Phoenix Theater, T. Edward Hamilton, a production of, of uh, The Matchmaker, which was my first professional job, and that toured New York State, and it had a star cast. Uh, so I was biting off more than I was ready to chew, but I could do it. Now, I had been a producer before then, but I had been a producer working in the office of a man who was the most sought-after director of musicals and, uh, and plays, George Abbott. So he didn't need a director. Right. And I discerned that he needed a producer, because he had been one for a long time, and his casting director, who was my boss, and I, I said, you know, he wants he wants to get that off his shoulders. Well, I now I knew some years later how much I wanted to get it off my shoulders. Why don't we take that role for him and provide producing the way he would want it? No surprises. Right. And and let free him up to be. And there. he rejoiced in that. And and our very first show, thanks to him, was a huge success. And so was the second. And the third was not huge, but it was still a success. So there was a sense I had there for a few years that things don't fail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but what, in your producing days, when, yeah. when a property would come up or an idea would come up, would you think, wait a minute, I want to direct that? That happened finally, but no, not in the beginning. In fact, there's nothing we did in the first between uh, 19, interesting enough, between 1954, which was the year of the pajama game, and 1965, when I did Flora the Red Menace, which George directed, uh, there was nothing that came up then that I would have wanted to direct. He was a very different fellow for me, and his taste was very different. We liked the outcome, and we liked the idea, but how he would develop a piece of material which I thought was valuable, say, the pajama game, which was about a strike in a pajama factory. If Hal Prince had developed it, it would have been far more serious business. It might not have been as much fun, but it would have had a different imprimatur on it. George Abbott made it one of the jolliest strike musicals with 
labor unions yeah, and, and, and people. Oh, the works. But he really, he really made it buoyant, despite the fact that it was about a very serious thing, fighting for seven and a half cents more an hour. Right. Uh, so I loved the idea. Then the development was his, and I sure admired and loved the outcome. And that happened for years. However, uh, oh, I think I'd like to, to sure. divert myself a bit. So George Abbott I learned a great deal from, which we ought to touch on. A director, aside from being talent, Ted, and creative, should also be, as far as I'm concerned, disciplined, uh, not self-indulgent. There is no relationship between histrionics and talent. history <laughs> and talent. Uh, George showed up on time, worked the eight hours, did his work, answered the questions, delivered his responsibility, and if there were bad days, and there are always bad days, he took them home, dealt with them, and came back the next day refreshed. Uh, I learned that from him right away. Wonderful lesson to learn. The same time I was working with him, I was working with Jerome Robbins. You couldn't find a a more different artistic head than Jerry's. However, he too had started with George Abbott, so he had learned the discipline, the thoroughness, the organization, and so on. So everything for, from his place was exactly the same in terms of, of administration. And then I was the guy who raised the money and, mm -hmm. and sat there. Uh, but then the shows could not have been less alike. And I would think that his shows were closer to what I ended up making my career with. But even so, they were different because I'm not a choreographer. And so there's very little dance in most of the shows I'm associated with. Uh, the, the, the difference between Jerry and George exists now between me and both those fellows is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference you have to. And here's a director's task. You can be a director, sort of ill-defined, a good craftsman, reliable, creative. But the ill-defined part, the part that you can't say that's who directed that, is something you have to, as a director, search out. My first number of shows were not clearly mine. She Loves Me was my first big Broadway show that I started from scratch. It's a beautiful show. I really love it. But if I were to put it up in front of you the way it was in, in 1963, uh, uh, who I mean, directed this? We wouldn't say this is you, a Halpern's. You wouldn't say that's for sure Hal. So what, what, what do you think, um, in a perhaps apocryphal, I mean, or, or, you know, fantasy situation, what would be the first thing uh, that you as a director would do? With, I mean, there would be a piece that would, somebody would say to you, Phantom of the Opera is a musical or something. Why Where am I attracted to material? It differs all the time. Yeah. All the time. I, I want to pick up where I left yeah. off because it's still an answer to your question. I was incredibly attracted to a book called Love is Just Around the Corner, written by a guy named Lester Atwell who just died this week uh, at 92 or something. He, he's entitled. Uh, he's entitled. It was a book about communists uh, during the witch hunt in America, and it was really in the 40s and early 50s, uh, a subject which interested me a lot because I had very strong feelings about where they came from, the theater communists, right. you know, and I did not think they were out there to overthrow the United States, not remotely. They were the interesting ones. And I had a, and I had an, a, a real affection for them, and, and uh, thanks to George's you know, open mind, we hired the first people who had been blacklisted in Pajama Game, in Fiorello. A lot of those blacklisted people found themselves working again uh, in those shows. So I wanted to do this show, and I wanted to direct it. And uh, uh, I had just sort of, I guess, introduced John Kander and Fred Ebb and told them I wanted to work with them together. I uh, uh, wanted them to work together, I wanted to work with them. And I offered them this book. And they said they'd love to do it. And they wrote the score for what became Flora the Red Menace. But I was going to direct it. It was going to be my first 
s expression of who I might just be that made me different from anybody else in the theater. Uh, one day, Abbott came in and heard the score being played on the piano in my office and knocked on the door and said, that's wonderful stuff. What is this? And I introduced him to the two guys. And he said, I want to do that. I want to direct that. And I didn't, wouldn't have dreamed of saying, no, I'm directing it. I said, OK, Mr. Abbott, it's yours. Wow. And, and he directed it. He didn't understand. He didn't have a handle on what his opinion of communists was. So on the stage were two different groups of communists. Villains from some old-fashioned musical and sweet... Yours and his. Dumbbells. Ours and his <laughs> were on there. But his, he wouldn't have thought of them as villains. He was just searching around for something that would be fun in a musical. And so it was really not on firm footing at all. Uh, but you as a producer now had a sort of a problem because you were caught between your, the director and I, wanted and to I do. Tried, and I tried to, 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 to support everyone. But very early on, when we got to Boston to open, I thought, this is a hopeless task. I'm really sorry. Liza Minnelli made her debut in it on Broadway. She got all the awards in the world, and, and the show didn't run. And it, it could be construed very unfair to Candor and Ebb, who were starting, to, to, to do that to them, to entice them, and then, but I was, after all, handing them over to the most sought-after director in the musical theater. However, there's more to the story. I knew it was doomed, and, uh, and it was really sad, because today, if you listen to the score, it's thrilling. Mm -hmm. It's as good a musical theater score as there is, but the book doesn't cut it. <clears throat> I said to the guys, the day before we opened on Broadway, I have another show for you. And, and that was uh, the Berlin Stories, uh, Sally Bowles, and became Cabaret. And that one I did direct for myself, and that one set me free. But, so, but, but for you as a director, could you today take, go back to the, the day that Mr. Abbott came into your office, take that material and do Floor of the Red Menace and make it right? Uh, you're talking to the core of something. I wouldn't. Could I? V possibly. Would I? Never. No, I any. find looking back the biggest trap in the world. The only time it's okay to look back is when you're looking back at someone else's work, i.e. Showboat, Showboat, and you say, I, this is the greatest material ever written. I want to be part of the future of it. But that's a different assignment. I, I, I couldn't deal with, with Going, going back, back and fixing something. So that so the directing is looking to the future. I, I think, uh, shall I get corny here? I think sure. life is looking into the future. <laughs> looking to the future. The past gives me it. I mean, looking back, uh, uh, looking back at your failures, and no one seems to remember how many you've actually had. Good. And you, uh, which is wonderful. You bet. But everyone has a lot of failures. But also, also, what's a failure? I mean, I think Superman was one of the best musicals I ever saw. I'm so glad you led me there. <laughs> and, and, and got the best review in the whole world and then didn't run. Right. But let me say this to you. If it weren't for my wife, Judy Prince, I would never have learned the most important lesson I've learned as a director. But it, it clearly uh, moves over to any art, art, artist's life. She got very tired of me about 15 years ago uh, saying something had failed when she knew it had succeeded. Right. And so she said, rather exasperatedly, once and for all, you must make the distinction between hit and flop, box office terms, right. and success and failure, artistic. artistic terms. And the minute she handed it to me, it was the biggest gift in the whole world, and I live by that now. That's, Thank God. No, that's great. That's great. Can we take a little bit of step by step through through yeah. through d directing when you when uh, find the project? Yeah, the idea. find the project. And of course, my hesitation is because knowing that you are a, a producer in your particular case as a director, it can start. It doesn't have to start with somebody hand, handing you a script. Nothing in fact, ever, it may not. I, I honestly believe only one musical has ever been brought to me in. 70% finished shape, and that, and that was on the 20th century. I was at liberty. I was getting on my own damn nerves. I wanted a directing job, and 
the Comden and Green and, and Cy Coleman came in and handed it to me, and I worked the next 25 or 30 percent of it with, on, and we did it, and I'm glad I did. But that's the only occasion. I feel far more comfortable starting from scratch. And start. These are very personal work habits. Uh, I, I don't have to get the idea, though I've gotten the idea for a lot of shows, but the idea can come from your collaborator, Steve Sondheim. What about Sweeney Todd? What's Sweeney Todd? Or uh, how about a, a musical about and some can, subject? Yeah. And you say, that interests me. Fine. Uh, this last thing I did is about a guy who ties 400 balloons to a lawn chair and soars up. So he can fly. Uh, to fly. Uh, uh, that's an idea. It right. turned out to be a wonderful idea, and it's very well executed. It sure is. But what I do do, I, it, we're still at the idea stage, and that's what I'd prefer. And then you start to work on the... I seem to be talking only about musicals, only because they're more complicated. But you start to work on the book. Then you bring in the songs. Now, there are many ways of doing that. Practically speaking, in the case of A Little Night Music, Hugh Wheeler wrote an entire play. And I got a bunch of wonderful actors to come into the basement of a theater, and they read the play. And when it was finished, Steve and I said, well, you don't need a musical. This right. is just a great play. And again, my wife said, you're crazy. I don't want to see that play. I want to see the music. Give me some songs. And talk, talk, talk some sense to us. But that's how specific. It was total. Uh, uh, Sweeney Todd, I think, was half. Half mm. a play and, and with, uh, with some music, and then a second act with no music at all. Uh, and and so on. But you're you're talking about the director working with the cre with the writers, which from, is which is step from one. go. From and, step and one. you should be available uh, uh, regularly to meet. And when when do actors and designers come into that? Designers. This is where I differ from I think all my colleagues. Designers come in very early with me. I I have enjoyed the company of designers. I've enjoyed the give and take of design. I have a good eye. I know that. And so basically, I bring in the designer when the first act is finished, and we start to talk about what it's going to look like. Then I share that with the authors, and then it literally affects how the play finally is written. Uh, that's what I meant by motor before. Right. That's what I meant by rhythm. Uh, the original Follies. As you well know. Well, I was going to bring that up because I have looked at that Ellie Elliotson photograph. In fact, I bought, thank you, eBay, I, or I bought a copy of that Life <laughs> magazine, and that picture, which you have always said, That's what inspired, inspired the set of the original Follies. Absolutely. It, there is more in that picture. The more I look at that picture, the more I realized it inspired everything. It, it, absolutely. The details. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and Boris Aronson, who did the most extraordinary set, was inspired by a photograph as much as I was. However, he was inspired by other photographs and other line drawings and other oil paintings for every show we ever did together. And so, so was I. Uh, uh, is this the collaboration that you're talking there's about? There's an, an element again in the design collaboration that a lot of people might be surprised to know about. And that is, Boris taught me that as important as visual references might be, it was the other senses that were equally, if not more important. So when we do a show, we talk about the smell of the place it was taking place in, the taste of, of, of what you'd eat there, the, the sounds you'd hear. Now, that's so important. I can see how important it was to him, but can you imagine how much more important it was to me? Amazing. Amazingly important. And uh, uh, so, so all those senses come into play as well as just the obvious one, the visual. And then, and, I mean, in some instances, weren't, weren't actors er, part of these projects early on, or were they all pretty much... No, no, I'll tell you where, they, where the best example of that would be my initial casting with Steve and Hugh Wheeler for, for Sweeney Todd was Angela Lansbury and Len Carrier. There were no other thoughts. That's it. It wasn't written yet. Right. Okay. Angie, we have this. Len, we have that. Uh, so they came in, and uh, I'd worked with both of them on different occasions. And they read the play for us. Uh, they read the first act, which had some songs in it, which Steve played and sang, and the second act, which had no songs in it. 
and uh, went away. And we looked at each other and said, it's very depressing, this second <laughs> act. There's no, where's the humor? And sounds so simple, but that's actually what was missing. And so Mrs. Lovett's character suddenly was recreated to carry the whole thing and make it, make it entertaining for people, make it her, so, so the, you know, in the end of the first act, you know, have a little priest and, right. and, and more hot pies. All those things were created out of a genuine sense that, that this show won't happen at, on, on such a, such a grim note. I happen to think West Side Story is another great example of that. Uh, and, and certainly, it's quite a famous story. Uh, 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 Officer Krupke was, was written. Uh, the general feeling was that these are not words that would have been spoken by kids on the street on 10th Avenue, you know. And, and boy, is that correct. Right. <laughs> but how would you like to see the show without the number, without the levity and lift that it gives you before people die on the streets? And, and Jerry, being a purist, kept saying, I, w I don't think that number belongs there. I think we should take that number and put it elsewhere or whatever. And, and ultimately did, and of course sank everything. It went back where it belonged. And I mean, we saw yeah. what it would be like without it. It's interesting. I'm reminded of, a, of, an, of an event I attended at the Dramatist Guild where Fred Ebb was asked, what is it like to work on a Hal Prince musical? And his answer, which I thought surprising at the time, but is very, is very smart, is when you go into rehearsal, you're all working on the same show, and there are no changes. You're set. And everybody in the room paused, and he said, of course, there are hundreds of changes, but you don't think there are when you go into rehearsal. You're finished. You're just putting it on. I think it's not a bad rule. It's, by the way, a better rule now than it used to be for anyone who wants to direct, that you should go into rehearsal thinking you've got everything right because you don't, right. but at least the surprise will be when you don't. In the old days, these are the days that precede me, except a, a little bit as a producer. Uh, on Damn Yankees, it seemed to me we threw out half the score in, in New, New Haven, uh, maybe a little less, but six, seven songs got rewritten. Scenery was left in the alleyway. In the alleyway. <laughs> New costumes were brought in. All that sort of thing would happen, but a show cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars, not ten million dollars. And so that, that easygoing, uh, Abbott would say, I think you may be right. I think that song may stink, but why don't we hear it? Well, hearing a song <laughs> means rehearsal time, which is very expensive, orchestrating that number, Rehearsing the orchestra in the orchestration of that number, a rehearsal that day to put it on the stage in the proper scenery and costume with all the actors sitting around. You add up all those figures and that's how shows cost too much. So today you really must do the b most you can to avoid that free and easy process which indulged us years <laughs> ago. So when you're, so now we're in rehearsal. You, now you have taught you, all your collaborators are, are in line and you now have a cast and now the first day of rehearsal. What's your job as a director? I spend the first hour at least telling why we got where we are. By that I present my collaborators, I present the scenery, I describe how each scene melds from one into the other, and why, why it, the all over looks like that, I describe the rhythm of the show. Now the best way to describe rhythm would be something like company, which was a big steel structure, like a, uh, about a, a whole lot of married couples living in New York who are all uh, really uh, childishly immature and selfish and, and competitive and all these things, which I think probably a lot of married couples living in New York are. And, and so we put them on a jungle gym. Only the jungle gym was rooms that they could play in. And then I wasn't happy with the schematic notion of the room being the same room all the time for these people. So wherever they were was the room they were in on this jungle gym at a given time. Assuming they have an apartment, there are 
right. other boxes mm -hmm. they can play in and so on. And we put, uh, Boris put in an elevator to surprise me that took them from the second floor down to the stage level. But other than that, there was very little. A bed, a table, coffee table, a chair or two, that's it. And that rhythm uh, didn't provoke, it inspired Sondheim to write a kind of kinetic uh, New York musical that could move quicker than any musical ever would if you had real scenery. If you had real scenery, you'd be stuck. Right. You'd have to move that scenery on and off, but we never did, so he could go as quickly as he wanted. Other shows have different requirements. It, it's fascinating because I, as I hear you, you, you describe these things, I, I'm sitting here thinking you're partly describing what I think a director does, you're partly describing what I think a producer does, but it's clearly if there weren't a clear director's point of view, then it wouldn't be as clear. I don't think there... I, I, I think you're... you're it, this is not a symposium about producers, mm -hmm. but I don't think producers do any of those things anymore, and I think that's lamentable. And the reason they don't do them is one, how much everything costs, so they're, they're blinkered. They're completely uh, uh, focused on how do I find this money and, uh, and that's it. Right. And how do I advertise? Uh, I, I never felt I was awfully good. I'm good at getting images for right. shows, but I'm not good at buying advertising. Buy the bus, spend. buy the oh, taxis. Oh, no, it's hmm. not something I enjoy nor do I feel good at. However, we're talking about creative producing. And you're talking about creative producing. And the truth is there are very few people today working in the theater as producers who are that kind, that kind of creative. I w wish there were more. The problem is finding somebody with that yearning, that talent, that group Un un affection that, right. that I was talking about, and the ability to find money. Yeah. You know? I want to talk about actors for a moment. What kind of actors do you like working with as a director? If you're doing a straight play, it's really neat to have the most accomplished <laughs> actors in the world to just give you what they have. You have you're stuck with casting them if they'll take the job, mm -hmm. but they're, they're there to just, just widen the horizons of each scene in some way that you just didn't imagine. If you're doing a musical, your needs are different. First of all, people have to sing, usually sing, dance, and act. Then you can be sure, or I, I'd like to be sure, that the people holding down the, the largest roles and responsibilities in the show can do all of those things with great acumen and, and great talent. But you are going to have, across the spectrum of a show, uh, bit players, uh, good character actors who've had a lot of experience, bit players who are just making their way up from uh, chorus work, uh, chorus people who've been in a long time, and they bring to that both good and bad. They bring their frustration. Right. Right. And then people who are just out of drama school, and they really are still looking for uh, line readings <laughs> and the confidence that comes of saying, no, do this. No, I know. They don't always want to choose where they're going to go or how they're going to react. They want to feel their way into a career in the theater. So your job as a director is to take these very disparate, 180 degrees apart they are, Angela Lansbury and somebody who just got out of the University of Utah and is, has some natural talent, and make them all look like they belong on the same stage serving the same material. And that's a challenge for a director, I would sure imagine. Sure as hell is. Sure as hell is. And, uh, and, uh... It's uh, well, a challenge you rise to time and time again. Oh, I, lo I, I, I love it. I just love it. But I have to thank Abbott for that because Abbott, uh, Abbott enjoyed doing that. Abbott probably gave more line readings <laughs> because he was a more impatient man than I <laughs> am. So he would give a line reading to a huge star, and the huge star would either take it or ignore it, but, but, he'd give it but he was he'd... six feet, two inches uh, tall, of handsome bloke, and by God, you know, who, you know, so it's Mr. Abbott. They always called him Mr. Abbott, even if they were stars getting 10% of the gross. I, I love it. Now, you wrote a, a book, and you, you entitled the book Contradictions. <laughs> and in, in the book, you talked about not believing in apprenticeships. 
but also talking about mentorships, because I, I mean, I, I certainly think that. Oh, you know, is there a difference? See, I, it's years ago that book. That's I just read it last night. It was very interesting. Uh, and I did say that. Yeah. Did I make a distinction? I don't know. But what it, could I have meant? But you said the book was called Contradiction, so I, oh, I yeah. took that as All right. Well, I think. But as one who benefited from your from your um, graciousness with with people and you know, mentoring people, I think mentor. I'm trying to analyze why there would be a difference, and I think maybe I've got it straight. I don't think much of people getting coffee right. for you, unless they're, they're getting the best part of the, the better part. If they're it, typing the lyrics, I'm, I'm still you, here too. You know, you ought to, you ought to, you ought to learn. Yes, yeah. you ought to learn what these guys are doing and how they're doing it. Uh, there's something to be learned from that question in, uh, that comes to my mind, and that is this: when I was a producer. When I was a stage manager, see, I was a stage manager before I did the producing game, and I was a stage manager. Are you ready for George Abbott and Jerome Robbins show? <laughs> and the the the, so the, the simple the positions truth, changed. <laughs> the simple truth is that you go home at night, you're in rehearsal or already in preview, and there's something wrong that has to be fixed. You go home at night, you look at the problem as the stage man, the assistant stage manager. You know? Right. Second assistant. Right. Stage. <laughs> and you dope out what you would do. Then, if you're, if you're me in 1948 and 9, you go into the theater and you watch Abbott or Robbins solve the problem his way. It's not your way. If you're me in 1948 or 9, you get very depressed and you go home that night and try to work out why his way was right and yours was wrong. And as the years go on, you realize, no, his way was right for him. My way might well have been right for me and my show. And that's how you start to develop at your own identity as opposed to someone else's. Would you recommend somebody today who wants to be a director to do the kind of path that you, to take the kind of path you took, stage managing, producing, directing, or some other I, path? I think it's a terrific path. I think there are so f there are far fewer producers and directors around to take you on and and from whom you want to even learn is the point but i think if you can attach yourself as a director i think there are two paths two ways to be a, a working director in the theater one is closer to my way which is attach yourself to a director you really respect from whom you can learn for as long as he'll take you and, <laughs> and for he as long as, as you can stand not going out on your own. The other is to get involved with the theater, a theater. In any way. Uh, in any way and make your way into the directing channel. Uh, the theater answer would never have been on my mind if you asked me this question in the 1950s. But now it's almost, almost the better path for a number of reasons, not just because uh, because you can learn all the various departments, but because we are now on Broadway seeking our material very often from theaters, not-for-profit theaters, that provide that material because it cushions the investment, it cushions the risk involved. There's something else, too. I, I'm just trying to make it, see if I can say this clearly. I would not be sitting here talking to you if I had come to the theater now to present, to, to, to direct company, cabaret, follies, to produce West Side Story, uh, Little Night, uh, not Little Night, Music, uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, and so on, those shows I doubt would make it onto the Broadway stage right now. Uh, what you see happening on Broadway is what's happening on Broadway for a reason. The stuff that I'm most associated with could not be done. All these shows that I've done are being revived, but that's a different right, matter. Right, Anyone right. will revive Follies or Company or whatever, but would they do it originally? Not in a million years. So I'm coming to the conclusion that the not-for-profit theater will have to provide stages and productions that the people from Broadway can come and see and say, okay, guess what? That thing about the Nazis, that works. That right. thing about the kids 
stabbing it, each other on the street, that can be popular, and so on. I think they, they will not know that from where they start. So that in a way the, the, the regional theater and the not-for-profit theater has taken over where the, the, in the old days the sort of out of town for a commercial at, uh, absolutely. When, when a musical costs. Absolutely, and they can't afford to do it for less money, you see. And they, they, you can, uh, th uh, those, those regional theaters, there aren't many that do musicals, let's face it, there right. just aren't. They, and there need to be uh, more and larger and more sophisticated, no question. Uh, but have you directed st uh, straight plays for for regional theaters and not for profits? Uh, well, I, sure, because I did th I did uh, the Great God Brown, the O'Neill Early and Neil play. I did Love for Love, the Congreve. Uh, uh, I I I worked. Uh, I did the Visit, a wonderful Durand play, for all for the Phoenix Theater, and they all were for T. Edward Hamilton, and and they all played Broadway. Uh, but they first went to universities and so on. So I've done that. I've been there. And now I've just finished uh, having analyzed the musical situation the way I did, uh, mentoring as well as providing, mentoring two musicals and providing the third, one-act musicals, which we did in the theater named after me in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And that, that's uh, another way to do it. And the newspapers came and gave them great reviews and, and, and how, so on. <clears throat> how did you find those people that, that you mentored for the, for the well, show three? It's all about networking. The two guys who wrote The Lawn Chair Man, I met via something called the Director's Company, which is an organization that uh, run on, on uh, 43rd Street off 9th Avenue, 8th Avenue, and that they, they provide di young directors with material, material with directors, and they provide them with rehearsal space and an audience in a theater that's on the premises that has a hundred seats. And then those things go on from there. One of the pieces they provided me to advise on was called Ness in Cleveland, about Elliot Ness. And there I met the book writer, Peter Union, and the, the, the composer and lyricist, Rob Nassif. I said, you guys are great. Uh, how would you like to write an original? I'm thinking of putting together three one acts for Philadelphia. They came in with their idea. My assistant, who's out of Harvard five years, six years, is a guy named Brad Rouse, a, a very talented young director. I said, you want to come in with an idea? Come on in with an idea and, and some tapes of composers, lyricists, and, 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 and some scripts to read. Uh, all of this I did in June of one year. I came back in September to find them. The third piece is by a young composer that we all knew named John Bacchino, who had, attacked, who had involved himself with something called Urban Myths, which was eight or ten, twelve plays in one right. evening. And, and I, uh, I took the liberty of saying, you know, that's not a good idea, twelve plays. And, and this one play, which has this wonderful score in it, very, very brief piece, is uh, not even an urban myth. Why don't you take it out and flesh it out and make a 20-minute one-act uh, musical out of it? And he uh, uh, did, mm -hmm. and Scott Schwartz did, fleshed it out, and that became the middle piece of the three pieces. See, I, I think what you just described shows, tells a lot. Among other things, it tells that you, who, who, as a man who uh, could probably go and sit in your study all day long and watch television, watch soap operas if you want, but you're not. You're out there at the director's program li listening to new things, encouraging new things, and I think that sort of goes to the first thing you said about keeping it's constantly a, it, it really learning. is so much a matter of how, how important it is. There's an erotic drive going on that keeps feeding you that you want to do. But, you know, uh, too many of my the colleagues more than my colleagues, the people who predated me, the great directors in the theater, uh, retired early. The wear and tear got them. Yeah, but you're... And if wear and tear gets you, it gets you. Yeah, and if it just kind of juices you up, you're lucky. But it's also, all... <laughs> when the wear and tear gets you, you should have a Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> I, think. I, think, I think Phantom of the Opera was... W w w I, I've never... I, Phantom of the Opera is the best thing that can ever happen to a man at my age. At your, at if, it, it happened when I was, if it had happened when I was uh, uh, 25 or 30, uh, it would have been a, a terrible mistake. That's another... Terrible disaster.
Because you wouldn't have had to work. I would not have had to work. I had to work every year. But I also love work. No, I think that's great. Do you, in your travels, have you come across schools that you think are particularly good at preparing directors? Well, I, I obviously, uh, I, I now know because the the, the Harvard, Harvard Mafia has uh, <laughs> invaded my office. Uh, <laughs> Brad Rouse started, and now I have four other people uh, out of just out of Harvard uh, they're, they're all girls and they're all <laughs> working in, in, in what is I, I find that th they're very superior uh, I've also found more more often than not that the designers that come out of Yale are amazing they're also pretty amazing at NYU and there are schools all over the country where they're amazing but but Yale has been a real mainstay for stage design and costume design. But but Harvard, I assume that those are undergraduates from Harvard. They're undergraduates. So they they there isn't a theater studies program there, is there? No, they just do a lot. I, you know what they 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 do study, but the same way I studied literature, it turns out to be mainly. But they do plays. They do a lot of plays, and they all they certainly work with uh, uh, the um, ART. They all right. are connected to that Brewstein Theater, and they and they work there. So by the time they get out of Harvard, they have worked a lot on that stage and in that theater. So you are you are still a supporter of of experience is the best teacher. Oh, you bet, you bet. I I I uh, I didn't have any uh, any uh, tr classical uh, academic training in theater. Not via a school right but I read every damn play there was I haunted the New York Public Library when it was on 40 when the theater collection was on 42nd Street I I I lived a fantasy life somewhere in in the theater that predated me I knew every play and that I wasn't interested in musicals that's the irony I was interested in plays so I really I really followed the history of of all those great playwrights, you know. But it makes sense, the kind of musicals that you've done. I, I mean, I, there's, a, there's a story, you can tell me if it's true or not, that you saw Hello, Dolly, and said, what's that, you know, get rid of that opening, no, that it title go, it song. It goes, it's worse than that. I had done the, I had done the, uh, the Matchmaker, so David Merrick called me and said, uh, I'm doing a musical, The Matchmaker, how'd, like, how'd you like to direct it? And uh, uh, Jerry Herman very generously came to the office, played the score, and when it was over, I said, what is that song Hello, Dolly doing there? What's that got to do with Dolly Gallagher Lehi Levi's life? What, 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 I couldn't get it. Now, if you had seen Hello, Dolly, which you did, at the same time you saw uh, She Loves Me, which was exactly the same season, right. uh, you would have seen that I did my matchmaker. my matchmaker in She Loves Me, I and Gower Champion did his. And it's sort of like your, 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 your story about the pajama game. That was George Abbott's that pajama was, yeah. game. If you had done it, it would have there, been there's, I, I, I don't want us to quit without my pointing out something, uh, which is that it's related to that searching thing, that ever searching and ever uh, maybe demanding more of yourself. Uh, the, the, it is very difficult for somebody working a long time in any art form to distinguish between expressing himself and repeating himself. And that's a distinction you absolutely have to focus on as much as you possibly can. Because in expressing yourself, you're making your reputation and your career and also feeding yourself the pleasures of creation. In in repeating yourself, you're damning the project, you're damning your creativity, and, and it's really hard sometimes to see the difference between those two things. And to encourage the one and, and to discourage the other. You, can't, you cannot walk away from expressing yourself. Because if you do, you're trading off someone else's vision of things. You can do it as an homage. You can say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do homage. a play in the fashion of Noel Coward, and then go do it, I guess. But not really. You, you really need to, to keep plumbing your own n creative needs. At the same time, you cannot sit back and say, I know that worked. That worked. I did that. I can promise you that'll work, and then you do it. And do it again. And it's a lesson that I've learned from experience. Of course, I haven't always right. made that separation. 
but I think that is a perfect place for us to stop. All right. We could go on all day, but thank yeah, you very I, much. This was fun. It was great. The American Theater Wing's Guide to Careers in the Theater is a project of the American Theater Wing and the New York Public Library's Billy Rose Theater Collection, Theater on Film and Tape Archive.